if you're having any problems hearing or anything. <clears throat> so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name's Matt Pohl, I'm the Manager of Indigenous Programs at the Australian National Maritime Museum. And today I wanted to give a bit of an overview of some of our public programs and consultation projects that have been in place over many years and also um, projects that are new on the horizon that we're working towards. Um, <clears throat> so as always, um, I'm speaking to you today from the Wallamadigal people on the northern side of the Parramatta River, but I'd like to acknowledge the Eora peoples, the traditional custodians of the greater Sydney region. Uh, Sydney being a harbour city, you know, there's just so much related to Aboriginal marine knowledges, whether that's in rock engravings, the records that we have of watercraft technologies. Um, being the National Maritime Museum, we're in a very special place as well to be able to not just talk about the history of the land, but our rivers and coastlines and estuaries. Um, what we refer to as sea country is a really important way that we are exploring the different ways and different knowledges that many, many nations across Aboriginal mainland Australia and the Torres Strait Islands have preserved and generously through museums shared with us as we um, develop our programs at the, at the National Maritime Museum. So you can sort of see a bit of a background here showing the urban expansion of the Sydney region, um, the encroachment on the harbour, the um, overwriting of the Aboriginal landscape. Um, it's such a crucial area of research to be working with traditional knowledge custodians and the authorised community representatives from our greater Sydney region, because it offers a bit of a template for the consultations that we do in many other parts of the country. I'd also just like to, before I start today, pay a very, very special tribute to a friend and mentor, um, an artist named Joe Hurst, who I've worked with for about 20 years, who very, very unfortunately and sadly passed away a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is one of Joe's works he completed in the last couple of years. It's a sandstone uh, Nawi model. It's on the Georges River. Um, he made this with the government sandstone, uh, sand, the government masons, um, a really beautiful tribute to the maritime knowledges of Sydney, of Sydney's rivers, um, and a very special memorial and marker of an incredible artist who, if you've ever traveled through Sydney, he has around 25 artworks in different locations. So if you've never heard of Joe, you've probably passed some of his work and I just wanted to dedicate today's talk to him. <clears throat> but so what do we mean when we say sea country? Um, being based in Sydney, we're on the path of these great uh, migration networks of um, marine life like whales. Um, <clears throat> when we look at the watercraft of the Sydney Aboriginal people, we can point to so many um, early colonial accounts, uh, early colonial depictions of just how um, prevalent watercraft were um, on the Sydney Harbour. Um, it's not really thought that people went out into the open ocean too much, but there are plenty of examples of people having incredibly deep, detailed knowledge of sea country. Um, sea country relates to the museum in so many incredible ways. We are the custodians of a really highly important collection called the Saltwater Bark Paintings, for example. These bark paintings produced up until 1991 were actually presented to the High Court of Australia as a living title to sea country. And as we look to the way marine parks and territorial waters of many of our parts of the country are being um, explored um, and um, protecting the ecological aspects of these marine parks, we're increasingly turning to uh, indigenous knowledges of our waters. And um, to be able to sort of explore how these concepts were work and how language of names such as Garagarang for the sea itself are being brought back to the forefront of uh, community projects 
it's a really special way that the museum and a unique position that the museum is in to actually tell a, a, a new chapter to what we understand of the intergenerational custodianship of country and sea country across Australia. <clears throat> Because one of the really fascinating things about Sydney is the way that we have um, possibly what I would say the largest outdoor art gallery in the Garingai National Park, just to the northern suburbs of Sydney. Um, people have done analysis of the, the types of engravings that you find and uh, more than 50% of those engravings depict marine life. Um, which says something incredibly special about the relationship of the sea to Sydney's Aboriginal community as well. Um, these are some beautiful light uh, time-lapse uh, painting photographs taken by Peter Solness over a number of years. And they actually just show us this um, deep um, exploration of Sydney's landscape but when we think about how relatively recent the harbour is in the scheme of things, I mean, it was only after the last ice age that the Sydney harbour itself filled to the extent that we know it now. The coastline was much further out to sea. Um, there's so much more that we need to be exploring. So, um, some of the recent work that I've seen in terms of underwater archaeology exploration, for example, involves exploring the type of environments where people lived on the coastlines and looking for similar shelter shakes, shelter shapes, um, such as underwater caves and different spaces like that off the coastline. It's just remarkable to think how many new discoveries are out there awaiting to be found as we um, explore more of um, the ancient coastlines of Australia. <clears throat> I really wanted to single out this particular um, rock engraving too, which is found in Bull Gandry. It's a, on the northern side of the Hawkesbury River, but it's also one of the few rock engravings of the Greater Sydney region, which actually depicts what we call a Nawi, a watercraft of the, of the Sydney region. Um, you can see it actually um, has this beautiful kangaroo motif sort of etched over looking into the Nawi possibly. But it also on the far left of your screen, you can see what is believed to be an ancestral being called Daramulan actually stepping into the Nawi. Um, you know, when you're approaching a rock engraving site, you're approaching sacred ground. These rock engravings were made to, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, we can only really speculate because there was just so little research done in, at the time of the expansion of Sydney that it's incredibly fortunate that the thousands of engravings which remain today still exist. And they actually offer a huge inspiration for community members, for artists, for authors, for people making public artworks. They provide a visual language as such of a very specific Aboriginal uh, artistic style, which is very partic particular to the Sydney region. And it's something that is, um, Incredible! It's worth exploring in so much more detail. I'm not doing justice at all to the richness and the um, the potential of these sites for cultural reclamation. Um, you know, the some sites have as many as 200 or more particular motifs within an engraving site. Um, do we read them like animations? Do we read them like hieroglyphs? Do we read them um, purely as artistic expression? There's some beautiful ways that we really need to be uh, letting community members offer this interpretive layer over the top of our current knowledge of these sites and expanding the story of what we know of Sydney's Aboriginal past. <clears throat> because I'd like to take a little bit of a step back because a few of my slides today also relate to our new exhibition called Shaped by the Sea, the way continental and the uh, mainland Australia today is actually shaped by the sea. Um, more than 85,000 years ago, according to current uh, archaeological research, people were making journeys into Sahul. It wasn't the case that there was just sort of one person who set foot on the, on the, what we, on the Sahul um, continent as such. They, there were multiple migrations. This is at a time when Papua New Guinea was connected to mainland Australia, as well as Tasmania as well. And we need to look to our Southeast Asian uh, counterparts to look at their exploration. There's some fascinating research out there 
um, the Paleolithic seafaring sort of research about what type of watercraft were people using in this vast time scale. I mean, it's quite impossible sometimes to just even visualize in your head how, um, <clears throat> how deep into time we can trace the human occupation of mainland Australia. And this doesn't actually clash with what Aboriginal people today are telling us that they have always been here, because I think in a lot of cases they've described the land as an ancestor itself. Um, when you've lived tens of thousands of years on the country, um, not necessarily in one particular place, but moving between different parts of the country, you start to get the sense of just how um, important watercraft were, not only into the first migrations into what we call Australia today, but also into the migration patterns of people, whether they traveled across the land or they traveled across the coastlines, there's an important um, understanding about why there is such a lack of evidence of um, the Aboriginal movement of the, the movement of people who became the, contemporary Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, <clears throat> so many of the sites of first contact with continental Australia are actually under the sea today. We can actually look to um, other research, which shows around 22 sites across coastal Australia where knowledge of um, ancient coastlines um, has been preserved. Sometimes this has been preserved in performance, sometimes in oral history, sometimes in song. But when we start to get a sense of even other archaeological evidence, such as the 65,000 year old uh, stone axe, which was found at Mujabi um, site uh, in the Kakadu National Park, 65,000 years ago, look how far away the Sahul coastline was to where this rock axe was found. So <clears throat> there's so much about our understanding of watercraft which challenges what we know about contemporary Australia today. And one of the key takeaways that we're trying to um, show, for example, in our news Shaped by the Sea exhibition is that people um, lived in, the evidence of where people lived is not necessarily in the ground or you know, on the mainland continent, it's off site. It's through our research with underwater archeologists, for example, that I think some of the more fascinating discoveries will be found in future years. Um, it's an important way that we need to be incredibly open to understanding sea rights, for example, when we're talking to mainland communities today about the territorial seas connected to their lands, we need to be building in these conversations about where research could be taking place based on the knowledges contained in these very specific um, oral histories and performances. So the the way that watercraft played a role into the not only the peopling of Australia, but the shaping of the intergenerational migrations which took place across the continent is where we can find some of the most exciting examples. And it's also through understanding the ways that um, watercraft were constructed based on their environmental knowledges available that we can start to get a sense of where knowledges have been transferred from and where people have taken ideas and spread them right around the continent. Even the most fascinating one for me is down in Tasmania here, the Rituia. Uh, 40,000 years ago, we have rock engravings up in the northwest part of the continent of the island of Tasmania. Um, you know, this is just remarkable to think of this huge human migration to one of the most southern points in the southern hemisphere occurring tens of thousands of years ago. Um, and we'll get to later the type of watercraft and how that is actually, how the contemporary representations of watercraft have um, been preserved by the community members there today. Because <clears throat> this is another really fascinating graphic, I think. This one shows the river basin map of Australia. So being the National Maritime Museum, we're of course very focused on the sea and the museum of the sea and being the Museum of the Sea. But we also have a bit of a mandate to explore marine knowledges and marine technologies. And when you look at this map showing the river basins of different parts of the country, there's actually a fascinating way you can overlay this map with the, the contemporary language map and start to get a sense of how the landscape 
has shaped not only the migrations of where people traveled, traveling via rivers, for example, but where different um, environmental factors naturally push these migrations of people. Um, you can start to see where the huge Wiradjuri nation from southeastern Australia or the Kamilaroi nation, which is the largest blue map on the east coast of Australia there, are starting to <clears throat> challenge what we have been working with in terms of this idea of Aboriginal people being fixed in one particular location. A lot of other research shows to incredibly fast migrations of people moving um, constantly, whether through seasonal, um, <clears throat> through chasing different seasonal patterns of animals, for example, um, but also um, <clears throat> exploring this map of country and the way that the environment shapes um, where our contemporary communities were at 1770 and 1788 um, is very valuable information for contemporary community members who are in a process of reconstructing their knowledge, not only of their own past, but of the continental history of Australia as well. So it's to all these nations that the museum has a bit of a mandate. Um, you know, even when you look at the drier parts of the country, I mean, Australia in the central parts, for example, is um, desert country in a lot of ways. But we don't need to go too far back in time to see when these desert areas were wetlands. And some of the more exciting archaeological research which is taking place out there is actually looking at um, ancient rivers, uh, dried up rivers in the landscape as being the first point of investigation for archaeological research, um, whether that's stone tool artifacts or possibly even wooden artifacts buried deep in the sediment, which has been dried up and preserved. Um, we need to be able to look at the marine, um, the way that mar the maritime world, whether that's inland or along the coast, connected so many different community members. And um, it's a mixture of environmental knowledges as well as cultural knowledges which have been preserved, which offer the two entry points into exploring that story. <clears throat> so I just wanted to show a very early, and I apologize for the, the, the tone of language in this one, but it's a really fascinating video, this one, to show Malay traders the type of these work that goes into producing ago. a watercraft. They brought many new ideas and were the first to supply the Aborigines with metal tools. Sap from beneath the bark of one of the jungle trees is used to cork the craft. Down on the beach, it's time to play out one of the daily dramas of tribal life, the return of the hunters. Life under primitive conditions has to be lived from day to day. Some days you eat, some days you don't. It all depends upon the hunters. So there's more than just the natural curiosity of children in the reaction of youngsters along the beach as the hunters come into their view. So I wanted to show that one for Malay. two separate reasons, really. Um, there's two actually different types of watercraft technology depicted in that video, but it also really, one is the tied bark canoe and the other is the lipper lipper, which is the dugout canoe style, which was largely thought to be introduced by the Macassan uh, Trepang uh, seafarers who for more than 500, possibly 700 years uh, in, engaged uh, Aboriginal community members all across the northern coastlines of Australia, from Broome in Western Australia to uh, Darwin, La Larrakia country, right across to Arnhem Land, to the Yolnu peoples. 
we have uh, so much evidence of their uh, seasonal visits to harvest tray pang and the exchange that went on. So more than for several hundred years before the arrival of the British, for example, the only people had access to steel. Um, the trade networks that the tray pang were connected to, um, some research has shown um, there are at least 14 different uh, trading ports between Sulawesi in Indonesia and Canton in the what's today Guangzhou, China, where that tray pang, which was harvested in the northern parts of Australia, was marketed to audiences. So Australia's involvement with Southeast Asia precedes so much of our time of what we understand as the first contact. And it actually offers an alternate um, viewpoint towards this idea of the British colonization of Australia from the East Coast. Um, it was an important, um, it can be seen in the watercraft technology, I guess is what I'm saying. There's the deeper tide, uh, tide bark canoe technology, which you can see on the left here and in this iconic photo taken by Donald Thompson in the 1920s. This photo was actually the basis for the film 10 Canoes, um, showing the magpie geese egg hunters as their um, making their way through the Arafura swamp in Yolnu country. Um, so this um, flotilla, I guess, of watercraft and the cooperative nature of people uh, using them is what is one of the key takeaways I wanted to sort of put across from today's talk in the sense that there's a, there's a collaborative effort that goes into the manufacture of watercraft um, whether that's with several people, you know, harvesting the bark or you know, using the steel tools in the Lipa Lipa dugout canoe. Um, but there's a cooperative aspect to watercraft manufacturer, which I think is a really important message as well. Um, I don't think it's the case that people just went out and randomly selected bark. Um, you know, there was protocols and permissions in place for accessing particular people's country where the best type of trees were found. Um, it was only different types of the year when the bark could actually be taken from the tree, for example. Um, there's this beautiful cooperative nature to watercraft manufacturer, which I think is starting to inform so much of our other thinking of um, how Aboriginal culture is not singular in itself. And it is actually a community-based um, project which brings together different sections of the community, but also connects communities in the sense of people using rivers to travel between different, uh, different people's country. So if you haven't seen it, Ten Canoes is an awesome um, background to the way that watercraft were an actual integral part of everyday life, especially on the Northern coastlines of Australia. And I think you can see that in that previous film that we watched as well. <clears throat> Um, uh, and that's informed contemporary art practice as well. So you can sort of see a bit of an example here where bark paintings and also, <clears throat> which, you know, relates to the tide bark canoe in a sense, in terms of harvesting in a very similar way. The harvesting of bark for bark paintings is pretty well the same as the harvesting of bark for watercraft manufacturer. But this is actually a lipa lipa, uh, dugout canoe style produced by the artist David Malangi, the artist whose work was appropriated for the first Australian dollar bill, um, where he's recreating that Macassan knowledge, the Macassan influence. You can actually see there's a Macassan woven sail, um, which is part of this artwork as well in the center of this photo. Um, so, this history of watercraft is not purely functional. It um, informs a relatively recent artistic tradition of acknowledging the type of um, experiences that people, um, of, you know, of history. There's just so many tangents that are all um, woven together into the form of contemporary watercraft. And it's actually through the arts. I'll show examples of a couple of other um, public artworks and contemporary art pieces which depict this as well. Whether it's in the film of Ten Canoes or in the artistic productions of Lipa Lipa, like David Malangi has produced in this work for this exhibition, um, that informs so much more of what we need to know about uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Australia's maritime history. <clears throat> 
Not to mention the huge tradition in rock painting, for example, not only of the arrival of modern watercraft from Macassar and later from the European arrivals, but also in the traditional watercraft, which are found in places like Kakadu, which are depicted in rock engravings. Um, the story of the Kakadu uh, rock engraving galleries is just phenomenal. I mean, you're talking about 25,000 square kilometers, um, with, which is basically an outdoor museum showing this huge um, historical transition of the landscape and the historical markers that people of everyday life, um, the rock art tradition informed the bark painting tradition, for example, the artists from different regions who had the responsibility to maintain rock art sites were also some of the earliest uh, bark painters. There's this beautiful connection to um, the way that people have artistically recorded Aboriginal history with outside of what we know as historical language that offers contemporary community members these important ways of engaging with the modern world. And we're really only scratching the top of the tip of the surface in relation to better understanding how people not only survived, but thrived for tens of thousands of years in so many other different parts of the continent. <clears throat> So a little bit of a jump, but once I'd like to acknowledge uh, one of the previous curators at the Australian National Maritime Museum, uh, David Payne, who has over a number of years and is today working as an honorary research associate with the museum, mapped out the different type of watercraft and the different um, historical knowledges of where particular watercraft manufacturing technologies are located. And, once we sort of look at the overview of this map, we start to see the way that environmental factors shape the type of watercraft which are being produced. Um, the tide bark, for example, in this example from Lake Tyres um, in Gippsland in Victoria, is actually a different manufacturing style to the tide bark that you find in the northern parts of the country, but also <clears throat> has elements of the same knowledge in its manufacture. So <clears throat> getting a sense of the ways that people adapted to their environments and that the, the environment dictated the form of the type of um, watercraft which were produced is an ongoing project. And there's actually many gaps in that record. Um, that need to be explored. <clears throat> but it's also important to not forget the socio-cultural layer which overwrites the use of Aboriginal uh, watercraft, particularly in Southeastern Australia. So this is a public artwork in Gundagai, which references the story of the Great Flood in 1852. For those of us, anyone calling in, joining us today from Sydney, you'd probably uh, recognize the sense of urgency and fear. We're currently in Sydney, we've had three flooding events in the last six months. Um, <clears throat> and there's this unrecognized contribution of Aboriginal watercraft to the economic foundations of the colonial enterprise in Australia and particularly in Southeastern Australia. This um, uh, public artwork references uh, Yari and Jackie uh, two Wiradjuri men who saved more than 65 people over, the, spa over um, the space of 48 hours in a great flood which happened in Gundagai in the 1840s, I think. Um, <clears throat> and it's um, a little recognised the role that Aboriginal watercraft played in the colonial expansion in helping the first settlers cross rivers, to move livestock across rivers, and in this case, actually rescue people who were um, <clears throat> exposed, you know, endangered by a great flood, which was happening in a very unfamiliar country to them. There's an important generosity of spirit which needs to be recognized and explored further, not to mention the unrecognized economic contribution of the Aboriginal people who used their watercraft in uh, not only aiding, but assisting the development of the colony of New South Wales. <clears throat> but this brings us back to the watercraft of the greater Sydney region and the great reclamative projects that people like David Payne, 
Uh, community members such as Dean Kelly in Sydney, for example, have been working on as an ongoing process. It's not an easy process these days to even harvest um, the bark for watercraft reclamation projects. You know, you need to negotiate permission with National Parks and Wildlife, for example. You can't just go into national parks and just strip anything, actually. It, there's fines in place, thankfully, that protect that a lot of that happening. So the community members that I mostly work with are from like the Office of Environment and Heritage, people whose day-to-day -day job is to actually maintain our national parks and to um, ensure the cultural integrity of what takes place in those national parks. But quite often they're the very same people that we turn to when we're doing reclamative watercraft projects. Um, they can identify sites which are you know, earmarked for future backburning, for example, and places where it is possibly better to harvest from rather than from other areas. Um, <clears throat> and when we look to the records of Sydney Harbour, you know, uh, there's an early account of explorers describing you know, up to 27 Nawi um, in, on Sydney Harbour, sort of in unison um, before the smallpox epidemic, for example. Um, and the way that there's a really important layer of this history, which is that um, a lot of those early accounts show that it was equal, if not more so, that women were the users of these watercraft and very likely in, engaged in the manufacture of them. So <clears throat> when we start these projects, we're starting to not uh, to retell the historical story in a way which um, benefits the community. <clears throat> we can also look to the language of the Greater Sydney region. So this is an interesting case of the um, way language reclamation works. So Wirang or Waran, as it is also sort of known, when it's, if you take it at its literal translation, it actually refers to the other side of the water. So where the Sydney Harbour Bridge is today built is actually one of the shortest areas to cross Sydney Harbour. And it's um, not surprising that it's also where the first fleet ended up in 1788, because it's a very, um, it's a gateway to the east and western parts of Sydney Harbour. Um, but, you know, to fix the actual word Warrain to one particular location is possibly not the correct way to do it, because it, also, it always means on the other side, it means to traverse the water, not so much be a specific word for a specific name for a specific place. <clears throat> and then once we start to expand on the known regions that we have in the Sydney Harbour, and you start to get a sense of just how integral the use of watercraft was. Uh, we saw in that other footage before, you know, four people in the one dugout canoe, but there's plenty of depictions of women and children, um, families as such, you know, using watercraft together and, you know, if you look at the seasonal differences, I mean, of course, summertime is a beautiful time to be out on the harbour. But on days like today, when we're suffering these severe weather events, um, the importance of being able to safely um, find harbour in different parts of where people are located is just cannot be underestimated. And there's also a really important connection to Aboriginal architecture, which I'll explore a little bit later. <clears throat> So thanks to other research by people such as David Payne, we can start to get an estimate of the type of hours that it takes. They do seem quite uh, quicker. Like this, for an example, is um, some research done by David in making a plywood and fiberglass version of a type of Aboriginal watercraft, you know, 32 hours. Whereas the stringy bark, the sweating of the wood, the um, holding it over the fire to um, steam it so that it becomes a lot more pliable to fold. This requires, you know, two to three people. It's not the type of thing that someone is doing on their own unless they're making something very rudimentary and makeshift. Um, you can sort of imagine these boat sheds at different locations, such as Warain, where people were probably manufacturing these watercraft all year round. Um, and it's a little bit echoed today when you go across Sydney Harbour and you see the places where people are tying up their contemporary um, canoes. Um, it's, a, <clears throat> it's an important um, way to see, um, you know, to see how these could actually be reinserted into the harbour. I mean, one of the future projects that we'd love to do is 
uh, working with youth, for example, to not only make the watercraft, but to actually use them, to race them, to um, you know, have fun with them in that sort of sense. When we're doing these reclamative technologies, it's not about just making this pristine objects which sits in the museum. You want to be able to do these projects in ways which empower communities to um, have that confidence and to share their knowledge where applicable with the wider community. <clears throat> so this is the map that David Payne produced. And without going into too much detail, what I really wanted to highlight was the gaps in the records. So when you look at what's starting here at the Great Australian Bight, all the way through to southwestern of Victoria, the, the archival record shows that there isn't a lot of history of that. But when we look, turn to oral histories and different community members that I've spoken to from this region, there certainly are watercraft in the inland areas of that part of the country, but they just weren't documented. So the absence of evidence doesn't prove that the watercraft doesn't exist here. It just shows you we've got a long way to go in terms of filling out this map. Um, and when we overlay it with the, the river map of Australia, for example, it's not surprising that there would be all forms of knowledges relating to watercraft which would exist that need to be brought to the surface and um, used to revitalize and re reinvigorate different communities um, knowledge of their own history today. <clears throat> so another interesting way that we um, community members are reasserting the knowledge of watercraft is through public art. This was a project uh, undertaken by Dean Kelly and several community members for the new Westmead Hospital. Um, and it's making a <clears throat> tide bark watercraft, but turning it into these benches at the hospital to sort of recreate that sense of a meeting ground. The Westmead Hospital is on the intersection of the Toon Gabby and the Parramatta River, for example. So historically, it would have been a site where people would have gathered and where they would have parked their Nawi together. So um, there's really special ways that through, as a museum, sharing the knowledge of what we have about different types of Indigenous watercraft is being reasserted into the cultural landscape of Sydney and the, the ideas associated with this technology which sustained generations of people exists in the public realm today, providing not only inspiration for artists, but a sense of pride for contemporary community members to reassert their particular knowledges in the public realm. <clears throat> But to get back to the environmental adaptation, so sorry we're jumping across different parts of the country today, but I'd like to take you back up to Broome because this is a really special example and the, the, this is an, a watercraft you can see in the new exhibition Shaped by the Sea, which only opened about a week ago, of a Galwa, uh, a Bardi um, watercraft. Um, made from mangrove and interestingly quite similar to the bamboo style of ancient um, Southeast Asian um, technologies which were possibly similar to the technologies which were made by some of the first people journeying to Australia in the past. It's a detachable uh, water raft. You can actually see in the top up here too, it has this um, really unique to the broom region sort of uh, basket shape which is which the catch which you know different tools that people are taking out on the water with them um, are sort of stored in um, it has the paddles when it's used for hunting dugong for example the raft detaches from each other and one part sort of stays wearing out the dugong while the the operator um, follows it slowly um, you can see a couple of other examples here from the Warra Warra people near the who border the Bardi. And I remember seeing this image on the left long time ago as a um, in a surfing magazine, as an example of the early technologies of stand up paddle boarding in Australia. Um, but you can see it can easily hold two people again, the collaborative and cooperative nature of using indigenous watercraft is comes through again and again through different historical records that we have. Um, and the way that they're adapted to different parts of the coastline, I think, is what is what helps us reaffirm that what the knowledge is that community members are telling us. <clears throat> so to jump back to another example, um, to go back to Tasmania, this is a completely different type of uh, technology, which was possibly brought 
at a very much earlier stage, even before uh, Tasmania was cut off from mainland Australia. Um, the, roll, the rolled bark canoe, this is a paper bark canoe. Um, this is a very early example from 1803 of an artistic depiction of the type of watercraft which people were using in the freezing cold waters of Tasmania, for example, incredibly sturdy. Um, and also, <clears throat> um, easily, um, well, not easily constructed, but um, something that would have been made and used over many years, I suspect. Um, we've been doing a recent project with the um, Tasmanian community member, Sheldon Thomas, on the reconstruction of these Ninga. And you can sort of see how <clears throat> the importance of their buoyancy. Um, there's a model on the left there, and we've actually commissioned a new one for the Australian National Maritime Permanent Collection as well, a full-size three-metre version of the Ninga. And um, the time involved in these ones isn't significant. It's not only in the, the rolling, but in the hours that take place in the rope making, which is associated. In some ways, the rope making to tie it together is a longer collaborative project that many in the community would have participated in in the final construction of the Ninga. So <clears throat> whether it's in waterproofing agents and the you know, sourcing of xantheria resins or clays, which are used to cork, the watercraft, or if it's in the, the rope making, which ties it all together. There's just hours and hours of shared experience that of people um, coming together to make them, um, which also just caves back to my constant theme today, which is the collaborative nature and the cooperative nature of manufacturing watercraft. A uh, beautiful picture here from David Payne showing the, the mechan the the background process of what we can know. <clears throat> then there's also just been these, I could point to probably 15 different uh, community reclamative projects. Uh, this is uh, Mugi, Uncle Mugi from Naranjiri country in South Australia, right on the edge of that map where the watercraft sort of drop off the, um, the, we've, we've lost the historical records of what type of watercraft were specific to that region. But right on the border there, we see this incredible project that Uncle Mugi undertook, um, reclaiming the, um, the type of technology specific to Naranjiri country in South Australia. Um, it's, you know, it's the selection of the type of barks, it's the, um, the heating of it, the, all the different elements which are going into um, the manufacture of these watercraft is where we need to be really investing our time as a museum so that we can actually get a fuller and clearer picture of just how people used their environment to feed their families essentially or to travel to ceremony in different parts of their country. Um, it's an ongoing process and we can also look to the historical record of the types of scar trees which are found in different parts of the country to signal different areas where we may be able to find examples of watercraft through their absence in the historical record, but through their presence in the scar trees which exist in the landscape. <clears throat> and once you start to interrogate the historical record, there's just no shortage of amazing examples of different types of watercraft. And when we think of the watercraft, it's important not to think of these as just the canoe. Um, you know, there's um, a much more um, a diverse range of watercraft. Uh, this one example here from Warnington Island, for example, in the historical records which we have, um, children are actually placed on this uh, wild bar and it's the people swimming next to it, pushing the watercraft and whether that's to keep also to transport food, uh, to transport other items of everyday life that people are using, uh, the type of paddles that people are constructing from nearby types of um, trees. There's just this beautiful environmental layer which comes through of people using their environment to traverse and navigate their environment. Um, I think God, that's gone really quickly. So I'm just gonna slowly go through a couple of the final sort of points of the bigger directions. Because um, the history of Australian watercraft also ties into our regional history. Um, <clears throat> Once we start to look at this map, for example, which shows the Lapita cultural complex as it sort of moved from the 
um, uh, New Britain and New Ireland off the coast of New Guinea into what we know as uh, Melanesia and Western Polynesia, <laughs> we start to see some of evidence of those great uh, migration journeys. I mean, this is equivalent to people taking off into space of its time. Um, you know, a couple of thousand years ago, people are making these great migrationary journeys, not just from um, into the Pacific Ocean. And there's just a deeper layer of um, cultural knowledge which we need to explore, that watercraft are the main entry point for us to understand. And this totally ties into the cultural continuity. So the technologies of those early Lapita, I think are evident in the type of watercraft we find in Papua New Guinea, and in particularly in the Torres Strait. So this is a very early drawing from 1849, but just look at how elaborately made this outrigger canoe is with the ornamentation on the prows, um, <clears throat> the platform um, and the outrigger technology itself. Um, not to mention the decoration. Um, it's showing cross-cultural exchange happening from Papua to, Taz, to Torres Strait to Cape York. I think some of the early examples of canoes, of uh, outrigger canoes, are uh, materials found at the Fly River in Papua New Guinea, for example, journeying all the way down to Lizard Island off the coast of Cape York. There's just this remarkable story there, which I don't think has really been articulated that well. It can find evidence of it in historical record. And of course, it's um, very well known amongst community members themselves, but it's an important way that we need to understand not only um, Australia's history, but more importantly, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge of how people, where people move to and where, how they move between places. <clears throat> Some more examples showing the advancement of uh, post-contact regions and um, the way that people adapted different technological um, advancements to existing technologies. Um, and you know, when you look at the Torres Strait, for example, it's it's an island nation. It's a connection between so many different um, islands. The knowledge of the weather, of the tides, of the wind patterns, of the ways, of the times of year when people could travel and when they couldn't, is a remarkable maritime knowledge which needs to be preserved. And we can also see how contemporary how it informs the contemporary examples like this ghost nest. Um, outrigger canoe, which you can see in the foyer of the museum if you visit. <clears throat> I've personally found watercraft an incredible consultation tool. This is from a previous project looking at watercraft, a model of a watercraft from Larrakia country in Darwin. Um, it was collected in 1888, for example, and there was just such little knowledge of um, the use of these watercraft in the Darwin region or Palmerston as it was known at the time. And to be able to share this knowledge back, I think is the main goal of myself, you know, as a curator and managing Indigenous programs today, because museums aren't really the, shouldn't be the gatekeepers of this type of technology. Museums should be site of transformation where we can give back as much as possible and help communities reclaim and rebuild. This is the five different types, which we'll see which you, when you can visit the Shape by the Sea exhibition at the Maritime Museum. Um, I think we've covered most of those today. And finally, this is our NADOC program. So if you are in Sydney, um, our ambassador for NADOC week this week, this is um, the artist Alec Tapodi, uh, Torres Strait Island, Badu Island man, who has depicted many watercraft in amongst his most significant work, which is his printmaking, but also um, in his more recent work, which is uh, sculptural works using fiberglass. He's also produced several different works as well. So I think that's pretty well getting up to the end of today's. And I think if there's any questions, I'm not sure about how the audio is working two ways. So if you'd like to put any questions into the chat box, I'd be more than happy to spend the next uh, couple of minutes just um, answering any questions that anyone might have. Okay, I can see a couple here. Thank you to everyone for letting us know the countries that you're calling in from, Wanarua. Wow, Manchester, Britain, hi. Uh, hello from the USA, that's amazing. Okay, Tamara, costing for material compared to which year period, please? Um, I think that question um, 
refers to the uh, the plywood version versus the bark version. I think David had a, an estimate in there of around $480 compared to the bark canoe, which is essentially free, but that doesn't take into account the time and labor involved. Do you have any information about the types of craft built and using on Lake Macquarie, New South Wales from Lynn? Um, thanks so much, Lynn. We, um, <clears throat> from what the records show, I don't think it's too different to the type of Nawi which are being constructed in the greater Sydney region. Um, you know, the stories of the um, people from the, at Suwabakal, I'm pretty sure there in Lake Macquarie, uh, traveling to Sydney are quite numerous. I think, um, no, yeah, God, I, his name escapes me, but there was a early colonial figure who traveled between uh, Lake Macquarie and Sydney region. And I wouldn't be surprised if use of watercraft was one of the main ways that he made that journey. Um, there are, one of the interesting things from Lake Macquarie is the 1839 American scientific expedition to the Pacific. Uh, they spent around two, three weeks in Sydney, Lake Macquarie region. Um, from memory, they don't have particular watercraft, although they may have a couple of paddles, but there's around 40 objects that were acquired by that American expedition in 1839. Um, one is an incredibly significant possum skin cloak. Um, <clears throat> but the Smithsonian Museum in the United States has a very fascinating collection from the Lake Macquarie Wabakal uh, community. And I think that would be the best point of call to explore that a little bit further. <clears throat> Thank you. Sue Ellen, that's beautiful. That's okay. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, okay. Can you talk a bit about what you would like to see next in the research of watercraft and how you would like to see such research used? Thank you. Um, thanks, Rachel. Look, I think the next step for us at the museum is really filling out that map of watercraft around Australia. We actually have the historic, the Register of Historic Vessels which has around 41 known watercraft in museum collections around the country. And I think there's probably at least another 150 that need to be added to that. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's some amazing people out there who've done uh, PhD research, for example, on very specific regions, but we need to sort of start a repository of knowledge, I think. And that includes the protocols of who, when, where, how to access the materials. Um, personally, I really find the um, areas such as waterproofing agents, you know, it's not just clay, you know, when we look at water carriers, we see um, xantheria resins and gums and different things like that. Um, <clears throat> one way we were able to uh, locate a particular item better was through the stitching techniques. That was actually through the Larrakia uh, consultations that we did, that we found that there's a very particular stitching style to the Larrakia models, which are held in museums. There's around four of them. And there was none existing examples in Larrakia country itself. So to be able to look at the, there was one held in Paris, there was one in the British Museum, there was one in the Maclay Museum at Sydney University. And it was the, the overstitching style of technique, which really um, helped us ground, locate that story a lot better and you know, provenance of the particular item better. <clears throat> okay, Ning Chen, thanks. Um, where can we see the rock art in Sydney? Can you suggest a few locations? Okay, the best one I think is called Elviana, Elviana Track. It's in Garingai National Park. I'll spell that out for you in the message. It's not easy to find, but it has great parking. And um, if you literally just uh, do a quick search of Garingai, uh, I'll spell that, Garingai National Park. <clears throat> There's sites which have been marked off by National Parks and Wildlife Service, which are the, the public facing sites. There's a lot of other sites, which <clears throat> thankfully one of the best ways to preserve them is to let them become a bit overgrown and sort of leave them unmarked. Um, 
for all sorts of reasons, sometimes because of vandalism, unfortunately, but also because of there's just a lack of resources and people working in that field to maintain and monitor the different sites. So Bull Gandry is another really good one, um, just north of the Tonga on the northern side of the um, Hawkesbury River. So if you just do a quick search on either Garingai National Park or Gandry, actually one of the easiest ones to see is at the Bondi Golf Course. So if you just head out to Bondi Beach and look for the golf course, um, out along the edge of the coastline there, there's um, a site which is pretty easily accessible. You just have to watch out walking across the golf course that you don't get <laughs> hit. Um, but an incredibly beautiful location. And I think there's a really beautiful shark in that one. Um, you know, the different, that you can actually, the, um, the anatomical sort of knowledge is whether they're in sunfish or whales or sharks or dolphins, um, you can actually tell the difference from these rough outlines because of the deep knowledge that people had in the where fins are positioned, for example, or the shape of the fins. So what some people think of as these crude outlines are actually incredibly accurate depictions of different types of watercraft that can be recognised by people today. Oh, the outdoor, uh, from Ning again, um, the outdoor museum is called Kakadu National Park. I definitely suggest going on a proper tour there because it's <laughs> vast and expanse. Uh, Kakadu is about three hours south of Darwin. Um, so you'd go to Darwin first and um, places like Jabiru um, are a good place to start. That's where the traditional custodians of that country uh, will take you on different types of tours to show you firstly the public layer of sort of what's accessible to you know everyday sort of visitors and through um, doing those initial tours you may get incredibly lucky and be able to go on a deeper journey to some of the other sites that people maintain and um, have responsibility to look after. So that's in the northern part of the country, in the Northern Territory, but Kakadu would, I think would be the best start if you wanted to see some of the rich rock art traditions which exist in the north parts of the country. And you know, the rock art and the rock engravings are not essentially that different, but they are two very distinct styles that show you the different ways that people preserve knowledge in different parts of the country. Okay, that's actually gone right onto time. Unless anyone has a very pressing collection, I might just say a very special thank you to everyone joining us on this bleak day in Sydney. And thanks so much for your interest in the museum. Um, I, we can be contacted quite easily. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to our Vaughan Evans Library or for our team in the Experience Division. We're more than happy to share our knowledge of different projects which are happening around the country. And as always, the best place to start is with your local community. Um, attend your NADOC Week events, get to know people, get out there and just try and um, be open to learning. Because once you start on that journey, you just see the Australian landscape in such a different, such a different way than it's been taught and known before. Oh, wow, that's a beautiful question from Lynn, Lynn um, from Kigari. What uh, credible knowledge about dugongs relating to rites of passage. Yeah, well, don't, and don't forget, there's actually archaeological evidence of a dugong making its way down to Sydney at one point. <laughs> um, you know, the, the types of knowledge which are embedded in rock engravings or in archaeological digs really challenge what we think we know about where people live, where they move between, and you know what, how people knew their environment. So, yeah, as I said, once you start on that journey, just be prepared that it's it goes it goes on and on and on. <laughs> but um, I think that's the best. Thank you so much for everybody joining. Um, it's been really lovely to share my very brief overview of different types of watercraft and the way they are cooperative and collaboratively helping reclaim all sorts of knowledges in Australia today.